みなさま、こんにちは。本日はアメリカ大使館主催の英語教授法オンライン研修にご参加いただきありがとうございます。Um, as I san mentioned, my name is Grace Choi and I'm an American diplomat working on education and exchanges at the US Embassy Tokyo. And I would like to welcome you to today's teacher training session by Jenny Selvage. Jenny is joining us today from Kansas City, Missouri, in the United States. She's a TESOL expert and served as the State Department and US Embassy Tokyo sponsored. English language fellow from July 2019 to March 2020 and was embedded in the Tokyo Metropolitan Board of Education. While she was here in Japan, she provided training to Japanese teachers of English and to JET teachers.、Um, she is currently teaching at the University of Kansas. As you all know, COVID 19 has created quite a few new challenges for everyone around the world. The US Embassy in Tokyo is looking for ways to support,、um, in particular, English teachers here in Japan. This virtual teach teacher training seminar series, as a result, by Jenny,、um, will cover various topics in TESOL. This is one of the ways we're trying to support English teachers here in Japan. I hope you will find this virtual teacher training series useful in your teaching and that you'll join us for many upcoming sessions、um, within this series in the future. Thanks for being here and enjoy today's session. It is very good to be with you this morning, or here it's evening. It's eight o'clock here in the evening. I, as Grace said, was in Tokyo for six months and I was going to stay much longer, but I had to return early because of COVID 19. But I'm very happy to still be able to connect with you through Zoom and through all of the wonderful resources we have through online technology. So let me share my screen with you. And if we could just make sure that all of our audio is turned to mute so that there's no interference, that would be great. Okay. So today's topic is communicative grammar teaching because this is something that I heard a lot about when I was in Japan. The great emphasis on making classes more communicative. And as always, grammar is something that teachers around the world always want more resources for. So today we're going to talk about communicative grammar teaching. So the goal for us today is that you will consider ways to use more communicative approaches to grammar teaching that balance input and output. And so, my goals for you as participants is that you will reflect upon the meaning of a communicative classroom, that you will understand the balance between input and output, you'll analyze lesson plans, and you'll look for ways that the communicative approach comes out in lesson plans, and that you'll gather ideas and resources that you can use in your classes. And so, our topics today will be the definition of a communicative classroom, the balance between input and output, the theory behind it. We're going to look at two lesson plans, and then I'm going to share some ideas to kind of get you thinking in this direction. There will be two times where I will ask for your input one in a poll and one in a chat box. And the first one is in the chat box. So, I want to see what you would. Say to answer this question What is a communicative classroom? So please share your thoughts in the chat box. We'll just take a few seconds to look at that. What is a communicative classroom? Is the chat working? Okay, good. Student centered. Okay, what else? What does it mean to be communicative in your teaching and in the learning for students? Asking a lot of questions. Yes, definitely. Interaction. Use the language of communication. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, 
good. Yeah. Learner centered, not lecture. Emphasis on meaning. Those are key. Right. Oh, the key. Listening to students, excellent. They talk to each other. Share their own ideas. Yes. So many great ideas here for a community classroom. So I'm going to get rid of that chat box for a second. When I was in Japan, you know, as I said, I heard everyone and I could feel the pressure people had to make their classes communicative, but it didn't always seem like there was a very standard definition of what that meant. So as was mentioned by some people in the chat box, it's very simple. Students learn language by using it rather than by only being told about it. So they're using language to learn the language. So this means that teachers have a different role. Teachers are not just the ones that give knowledge to the student, they become facilitators. So instead of teaching about language, teachers design lessons and really create opportunities for students to learn the language and to acquire the skills they need. This is because input alone, so just a student receiving input from the teacher will not produce language fluency in the productive skills. It's just not going to happen. And this is why you see students study for years and maybe not be able to have a conversation very fluently because maybe they were only receiving the input and didn't have a chance for output. This shift in the role of the teacher is not a small one. If you have really been a part of the way where teachers just lecture, which is very common in a lot of places, this is a significant change. And so I'd like you to be gracious to yourself and make small changes in the direction of becoming a little bit more of a facilitator of language. Okay, so we talked about the definition. So now let's talk about the balance that we need between input and output. So let's make sure that we have a clear definition of the terms. So you see our scale here to provide balance. Input is when the student receives language through reading and through listening. Something that we need, it's very important. Output are the productive skills, the speaking and the writing. And when we talk about speaking, we're not talking about simply repetition. I saw that a lot in many of the classes that I observed. This is speaking and using language in real authentic ways. So we need both of them. One is not better than the other. They're different and we need all of these. We need a balance. So this is another time where I'm gonna ask for your input. So when you think about balancing input and output, and I know we have some pre-service teachers with us today. So those of you who are teachers, what have you found to be the top two challenges of balancing input and output? Just choose two. Lack of class time, large class sizes, pressure to cover material for entrance exam, unsure of how to add output activities to a lesson, and classroom management concerns. I like seeing all the numbers move. Okay, seems like we're getting a little bit of Clarity here about the top two. Just give it another maybe five seconds. Okay, for a while now we've had the, the same top two. And this is what I kind of assumed. So large class sizes and the pressure to cover material for the entrance exam. And then a close third is unsure of how to add output to a lesson. Yes, large class sizes is a huge component of how to do this and how to do this well. And then the pressure to cover material and I'll try to address both of those. So it was very interesting to see your responses. Thank you for those. Okay, so 
We will address those. So let's think about this with a lesson. So when you plan a lesson, this is one way that you could approach it. You could have four tasks, four things you need to think about. First, explore a topic. This could be your warm up. This could be where you're talking about the content. So maybe I saw a lot of textbooks that had Malala as a topic. You're exploring that topic. Who is Malala? What do you know about her? And this is a time where you're trying to get vocabulary out. Maybe students only know a word in Japanese. That's when you could say, okay, in English, it is this. And so you're building a base of vocabulary, a bank of vocabulary to use. This is low stakes. Students should feel comfortable. There's no testing. There's no assessment here. It's just exploring the topic. Okay. Then the second part of the class is then focusing on the language, focusing on the grammar form and the grammar usage. Very explicit. Then the third is responding to the topic. Students then respond themselves and engage with the topic. And then they produce language. And this we think of as practice, practice, practice. There is a very common saying, practice makes perfect. But something that I heard from a colleague that I really like is practice makes permanent. And that's what we're going for here. I heard one teacher when I was in Japan, we were talking about this push to make things more communicative. He said, yeah, I feel the pressure to make my classes more fun and make them more communicative. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. The communicative approach, the goal is not that it's just more fun for the students. While that is important, it's very important that students are interested in the topic, and it's always best if students enjoy themselves, but that's not our goal here. The goal is for permanent knowledge and long-term storage of what they're learning, and that's what practice does. So the goal is not just to be able to learn it and take a test. A lot of people, they thought that from conversations I had that you either prepare your students for the entrance exam or you do a communicative approach. This is for fun, this is for the test. If you do a communicative approach, students will learn the material more deeply and they will test better because they actually know they didn't just memorize, which doesn't stay long in our memory. So the practice, practice, practice is very important here. So let's look at the theory here behind this. And a man named Paul Nation is the one who created the term, the four strands of a language classroom. So four strands that you need. So we have, again, we have our input side. So the first strand is meaning focused input. So this is just talking about the content, building vocabulary, getting students to understand the meaning of what you're talking about generally with the topic. It's our first strand. The second strand is the language focused learning, the focus on the form. Then we have our output side meaning focused output. So students are talking about the topic. They're engaging with the topic. And then the fourth strand are fluency activities. By fluency, we're talking about lots of practice because we want it to become permanent. We want it to become something that they just are used to doing because they've done it so much. What Paul Nation asserts in this theory is that all four of these strands need to be given about equal time in a class because they're all four important. So this doesn't have to be all four in one 50 minute or one one hour class. It doesn't have to be that. Maybe you are doing a three day lesson. Maybe it's two weeks. I don't know. However, your classes are divided, but somehow you need to give equal attention to all four strands. So let's look at this in what we talked about in the previous slide. So that first part, meaning, focus, input, exploring the topic. You're talking about Malala. You're talking about Nobel Peace Prize. And you're talking about refugee. And you're talking about um, terrorist attack, things like that, words that they need to know. 
then the explicit language instruction. This is where you have your grammar point, your target language. So whatever it is, maybe it's the past tense. This is where you are explicit in explaining the use of the past tense, the form of it, irregular past, all of that. When do you use it and why? It's very explicit. You ask questions. You make sure students can ask questions about the form and the usage. It's very explicit. Then the third strand, meaning focused output, is just responding to that topic. So maybe they start talking about what they know about Malala. And then they're getting good at it. This is what Paul Nation says. This fluency stage is where they're getting good at it. They do it so much that they're just really good at it by that point. Practice, practice, practice. All of our audio is off. Okay, so we talked about that theory of input and output. So now we're going to look at two lesson plans that have this balance and that use the four strands. So the first lesson is aimed at beginners and we always need a goal that we know and that our students know to identify household objects using there is and there are. So you'll see this line, this green line, above it is the input and below it is the output. Okay, so we have two strands on the top and two strands on the bottom. So, may begin with the teacher shows a picture of a living room and asks students what they see. What do you see here? And this is where you build language. Maybe they don't know the word sofa in English, so you clarify that from Japanese. Here you're just getting them to talk about the topic. Then, I need to move this around. The teacher writes sample sentences on the board and explains the difference between singular and plural, explains all of the things that have to go into using there is and there are. Okay, so how would I do it? I gotta move myself again. All right, so I would say, all right, let's use objects that are in our classroom as examples. And I would write these sentences on the board. Then I would really talk about the usage. I'd say, okay, there is a teacher. How many teachers are there? Yes, one teacher. So we use there is. We have one other word in there. There is a teacher, a, right, that's an article. A is used for a singular noun. So you're talking about there is, there are, talking about articles. There are many students. Students, yeah, more than one. So now we use there are. We have the word many. We have that quantifier, that determiner. So we have to add the S to the end. Go through these. Then you could talk about the same thing with five. Five, we need the S ending. Many. There is an ALT. Okay, one ALT. And, and, why not a ALT? A ALT, right, it's a vowel sound. So there is, there are has so much in here. You talk about singular plural, you talk about plural noun forms, you talk about articles, you talk about determiners. So there's a lot of language here in that second step. Now we're moving to output. So then students engage with a topic and they personalize it. This is very important about this third step. Students personalize and apply it to their own life. So students brainstorm a vocabulary list of items from their own living room and write sentences about it. You could be going around and helping them, making sure that they understand the difference between singular plural. And then they need to have an opportunity to do lots of practice using there is, there are, and I'll show you that in a second. So what you notice at the top, the teacher shows, the teacher writes. And at the bottom, it's the students. So again, that input at the top and the output by the students at the bottom. So one way to do this practice with there is and there are is with a gallery walk or a padlet. So students could write all of their sentences on a piece of paper and you could hang them on the wall and then you could have students go in groups of maybe two or three. There are no names on any of the papers 
And students go together, they read all the sentences out loud. So they're practicing over and over again that there is, there are. And then as something fun, you can have them guess whose living room do you think this is? So the big challenge is how do you do a gallery walk in a tight room with 40 students? You may not want to. If you have a class that big, it may not be conducive. It's up to your judgment. One idea is if you have a hallway space, you could do half of the thing, the gallery walk in the class and half outside. If you have space, this is a great thing to do, but if not, it might not be worth it. So this is a great thing to do so that students are looking together at work and they're moving. It's always good if you can get the students out of their chairs to move because it kind of helps the brain work a little bit too. Okay, if you don't have space, then there's great technology you can use. So one uh, thing that's very common now is Padlet, padlet.com. And you get a couple for free and then you have to pay maybe like 800 yen a month for this. But this is a collaborative writing space. It's not the only one. You could use some Google products. Um, you can use OneNote. But Padlet is great. It's a little prettier. It's a little more fun. So I send this to all of my students and they individually add their responses. What I like is they could add their own picture of their own living room and then they could write their sentences. Again, there's no names on any of these. So what you could do is you could flip your class and have them do this at home. And so when they come into class, you can go right into your practice, practice, practice together. You don't have to spend a lot of time in class during the writing. And it looks kind of cool. It's cool to have their picture. If you don't like this, they could bring a picture in of their living room. So Padlet is a wonderful resource for you for something like this. Okay, let's move on to our second lesson. It's a little more advanced or maybe an intermediate or an advanced audience. And our goal is to describe life experiences using the present perfect and the simple past. This is a great thing to do because so many times students get confused about when to use those two. Because sometimes you could use either of them and it's fine, but sometimes you use one or the other. So again, we have our line, we've got input at the top, we've got output at the bottom. So one idea is a teacher, AL, an ALT or two students, however you want, reads a dialogue between two people. Then you analyze the text with students to identify the target grammar and you discuss the differences between present perfect and simple past. Then the students respond and make it personal. Students create sentences of things they personally have done. And then there's an activity which I'll go and I'll explain more in a minute. So again we've got the teacher at the top, students at the bottom, the balance of input and output. So here's what it could look like. So this is a dialogue traveling. So even before you do the dialogue, you could ask them some questions about where they have traveled. Where have you been? Where would you like to go? What's the coolest thing that you've done? So you can get them warmed up with that. And then you go into this dialogue. Okay, this is meaning focused. So you're just trying to get them to comprehend the topic, to engage with the topic, to build a little interest clarify any vocabulary. So scuba diving, maybe that's a new term, I don't know. Desert. So this is that first strand. Then the second strand is the focus on form, the explicit language teaching. For us, it's the grammar teaching. So then I took the dialogue and I underlined the instances of the present perfect and the simple past. I wrote this myself because I wanted to make sure that it included everything I wanted in it. So you'll notice it has have traveled, the affirmative. It has irregular past, saw, and it has regular past with the ED, visited. It has the question form, have you had? I've been, it has contractions. And then down at the bottom, 
I've never been. So now I have a contraction and I have the negative form. So everything I want to teach is right here in this. So I'm going to show you what it might look like a little bit on my board up front. So I would talk about the present perfect and explain we use it for something that started in the past, continues to the present, maybe is unfinished, may continue into the future. Then I focus on the actual form, have or has, plus the past participle. And if they're not sure of the past participle or third form, you could talk about that, you could give them a list of that. So our sentence from our dialogue, you and your family have traveled a lot, right? I always do timelines when I teach present perfect and simple past. So something started in the past continues to affect the present. You traveled in the past and will continue to travel. You're not done traveling. It wasn't a one-time event in the past. So we use the present perfect. Then we've got the simple past. Started and ended in the past. It's finished. Maybe there's a specific time. You talk about the form, the ED ending or the D ending or irregular endings. Here we have we visited and then I have my timeline. It happened and ended in the past. It does not affect the present. It's finished. So this is what I would show. And I would, of course, do more examples than this, than just those two. But this is a little, little bit of what I would do. So then I move to meaning-focused output, that third strand. So again, we make it personal for the student. Write five to eight sentences of things you have done in general in the past, unspecified time, and then things you have done at a specific time in the past, because we're trying to get them to do both present perfect and simple past. So again, we're just engaging with the topic, with travel, the content related to travel. They're using vocabulary maybe that we created on the board. So this is one idea that I got from a colleague. All good ideas come from helping each other. So one idea is everyone has already written their sentences. You bring three students to the front and you figure out one thing that they did, one person. So maybe one student said, I have ridden a camel. So then all three of the students stand up in front and they say, I have ridden a camel. I have ridden a camel. I have ridden a camel, but only one person has actually done it. So then the task for the class is to ask simple past questions to try to see who it is that actually rode a camel. Where did you ride a camel? How tall was the camel? Did you have to take riding lessons? Was the camel friendly? So here students are becoming very good at giving sentences in the past tense. Practice, practice, practice. And hopefully, you know, however the students answer, they'll say, oh, it's you, you were the one that did it. So this is just one way that you could have students be active in how they produce and practice the target grammar. Okay, we talked about the lesson plans. Now let's talk about some other activity ideas. And these are not exhaustive. There are many more. These are just to get your mind thinking in this communicative direction. So what you need to ask yourself when you're creating a lesson is how do my students or how do I want my students to use grammar to communicate in real life? What are some real life situations that I could use to help my students use and apply the grammar? So you need to ask yourself first, what is the target grammar that I'm focusing on? Simple present, conditionals, past, present continuous, subjunctive, whatever it is. What is that one target grammar? Focus on that one piece of grammar. And then if that's my grammar, how could I facilitate something where students can apply this grammar to real life communication? And it's important to tailor it to your students. Your students might be different than students in another city or in another prefecture. How could this apply to your context? 
So one idea is to tell a story. It's the simplest idea. So you could do a show and tell. So a student could bring in an item and explain what it is, what it means to them. So they're using the present. This is my stuffed elephant. I got it when I was three years old. So we're using lots of different grammar. So depend on what grammar you want to use. A skit, they can act something out. Or they could do a mini book. I know you can't see it very well. So I just did this mini book. What's great about this is it's one page of paper. So if you want to do eight, you fold it, fold it again, and then you cut it here. And then it becomes an eight page little booklet. And so let me see if I can get this. I did one for my COVID journey from February to July. So here I have it month by month. I'm a terrible drawer, so please don't laugh at my drawing. But February, here's this airplane. I traveled to Indonesia and everything seemed okay. I put my past tense verbs in a different color to highlight that use. In March, don't laugh at this terrible drawing, but there's Japan, there's me. An official pandemic was declared, so there's the passive tense. And I had to leave Japan. So then I go month by month and I talk about what I did each month. And in the end, I have a quote from Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. That is our, my theme for COVID, everything changes, who knows what's gonna happen. So a mini book can be used for any number of grammar topics however you want to do it, but it's quick and easy and it only takes a piece of paper. It also gets students creativity flowing. They can draw. If they're really good at drawing, it can highlight those skills, especially if they're struggling with English, have them do something they're really good at. So telling a story is a simple one. Explain how to do something. I love this one. Give directions somewhere. Do a science experiment. So how to cook your favorite dish or show a video explaining your father or mother making a dish. You could do this on Flipgrid. So you could have students go around, they could tape, they could videotape their experience and then they can narrate it, they could post it. So if you look on Flipgrid, there are many science experiments on there that you can look at. Maybe you're saying the topic is, okay, I need you to teach your grandparents or your great grandparents how to post on Instagram. How would you tell them to do that? What I like about this is it uses grammar. It also uses first, second, third, next, after that, those time order transitions. So there's a lot of good that could happen when they explain something. It also explain how to play a game or sport. I saw many elementary students riding unicycles when I was in Japan, which is very different. We don't do that here. So maybe you could say, tell us how to do that. How did you learn? What are the steps to do that? How to play soccer? What are the sumo rules? As a foreigner, I was new to sumo, so I didn't know. So there's endless things that they could do there. They could do hypotheticals. What would happen if, so you give this question to everyone, what would happen if, close again, whatever you want, and they have to say, if school closed, I would. They're using the hypothetical conditionals. Design an ideal school or an ideal city. There's a song, common song in English, If I Had a Million Dollars. It's a great conditional song. What would you do if you had a million dollars? If I had a million dollars, I would do this, I would do that. If you're talking about Malala, maybe you could talk about, if you could change the world, what would you do? So these are so some hypothetical things you could do. Advice giving, maybe you could have a project where they create some kind of pamphlet for tourists. As a tourist, as a foreigner in Japan, I needed so much help. Maybe they could create something for tourists, how to get around your town. Maybe they're high schoolers and they create a pamphlet for new freshmen or new students coming into the school. 
Maybe they have advice they want to give teachers on how to do this or that. So you could even go as high in grammar as using the subjunctive here. I recommend that. I suggest that. I advise that. So you could use some grammar there. If students are applying to college, you could do mock oral interviews. Maybe they give their personal statement, which uses a lot of past tense and switches between past and present. That's another important grammar point to talk about, how you switch back and forth. So a higher level student may need to know how to switch between the tenses pretty easily. So these are just some ideas for application. That you create do you kind of your own to, bank. Do you need to re reinvent ideas. the bank. So where do you go for ideas and resources? We have a saying, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. That means you don't need to do everything yourself every time. You're all so busy. Japanese teachers are busy people. And so it's good to share ideas and get ideas. The first thing that I do when I have something new I need to teach, I see what other people are doing. I get ideas, I share. So I want to show one resource that is especially helpful and I'm continuing to learn more about is the American English website with the U.S. Department of State. It's AmericanEnglish.state.gov. It's there in the top right. There are webinars, there are articles, there are games, there are lessons. There are so many resources. This is just one that I pulled up for grammar games. So it has all of the resources that you would need to do this. Also in American English, here's one webinar. This was communicative grammar games for the young learner. So those of you who are maybe doing younger, maybe elementary. So I loved this game. They had an object in a bag. Students didn't know what it was. One child comes to the front with you and they can feel in the bag. They don't know what it is yet. Then the children in the class, they ask 10 yes or no questions with a chunk. A chunk would be like, it is, it isn't, it does, it doesn't. So they guess what's in the bag. If we look at our four strands, what you would do first, brainstorm a list of adjectives. Then the language, you would teach present sense question form and yes or no answer form. So that is your explicit teaching. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. So that's explicit teaching. Then you give time for students to write down a list of questions. And then this game would be that fourth strand where you're practicing and practicing and practicing. After students say, yes, it is, no, it isn't, over and over again, it becomes very rote and they learn it. Another great grammar resource for you and for your students is engvid.com, E-N-G-V-I-D for English video. So here I'm highlighting all of the topics that they have. So for many of you, you teach a wide range of students. There's business English, there's expressions. Some people really like idioms and like to talk about idioms. There's a lot for grammar. There's IELTS, TOEFL and TOEIC preparation. There's pronunciation, there's slang, there's speaking, there's vocab, there's writing. And if you look up in the left, you can choose which level beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And here's a list of teachers. After a while, when you're on this, you get your favorite teacher. My favorite teacher is James, in case you end up liking him as well. This is a great resource. When I was first teaching grammar a long time ago, I would go to places like this just to figure out how to teach the grammar rules. So it's a great place for you to go, or you could send your students there as well. What's so important is that you build your network of support. So many times I saw teachers doing everything on their own, creating materials on their own for every single lesson. You don't have to do that. When you meet other teachers, find a way to build a network so that you can share with each other, so you can lighten your load a little bit. 
it's so great when I work with my colleagues, I say, hey, I'm gonna go teach the subjunctive. Do you have any activities that work well for your students? They say, yeah, actually I did this and it worked well. Share with one another. And there are so many things online as well. If you just Google conditional activities, you're gonna come up with a list of things. So really get into a practice of looking for resources so you're not reinventing the wheel every time. So to recap the four steps, you explore a topic, you build vocabulary. Then second strand, you focus on that target grammar, that target language. Then students respond, start doing some output, but they personalize it, they apply it to their context. And then students practice, practice, practice for that fluency so that it becomes something that they learn deeply in their long-term memory. So those are the four ways that you can balance input and output. Here are a few resources. So I always go to resources when I give a presentation or when I do anything really. And if I really encourage you to look at that last article by Paul Nation about the four strands. And I can show that later if anyone wants. Okay, so I just gave you a lot of information. Now is the time for questions. We have about 14 minutes for questions. So if you have any, please put them in the chat box. Okay, yes, someone asked about the paper to make a book. Oh, I don't need to do that, hold on. Okay, so I take one piece of paper and if you want eight, you fold it in half, then you fold it in half again you pull it up and then you just cut to the middle. And then you can kind of play around with it, but then I fold it. And so this is like this. And then I have my booklet. These are great. And it's such a great thing to do with just a piece of paper. So fold it in half, fold it in half again, cut. And if you Google mini book, I'm sure you'll find directions there as well. Okay, another question. Regarding some presentation-based activity like show and tell, one of my issues is how I can enhance engagement of students who are listening. What you would do is you would give them a task. Give the students who are listening a task so they have to respond. They have to ask maybe one or two questions to the person to get a grade. So I would give, so we do a lot of grade based work, which I know is different, but I would give a grade to the person giving the show and tell and a grade to the participants because it's also a speaking and listening task for the students who are listening. I do believe the slides will be available later. This presentation I do believe will be available later. So someone asked if you can watch the slides again. What kind of grammar book do I recommend for Japanese young learners? I haven't worked a lot with young learners, but from what I would guess is I wouldn't use a book. I would, because the grammar is so basic. Um, what I have used for beginner, they weren't kids, but you could use them with kids. Um, some kind of Azar like. But I would I would create all my own materials. And there are materials out there. If you Google beginning grammar for young learners, you will find resources. I wouldn't use a book because I haven't found any good ones out there. But if I do find one, I will somehow get it to you. If you maybe you will send me an email and I'll give you my email. 
Okay, so someone asked, can you tell me about the balance of the lesson plan? How long? That is up to you. But what's important is that you balance the four strands. So you're giving equal time to all four of those pieces. So maybe you do a whole class on one strand and then the next class you do it on the second. Maybe you do half and half on one day. It depends on your class, how often you meet and maybe your unit, but you need to think overall with some overall planning so that you get all four of your strands. Good question. Okay, how can we make sure the students are using target grammar correctly while practicing? That's when I correct them gently, but if they make an error, so they say, there is two chairs, I would say, there is two chairs? There is two chairs? And they would usually catch it, no, there are, I'm like, yeah, there are. So I wouldn't say you're wrong, I would maybe coach them and guide them, but I do think it's important to, um, point out errors when they're learning the form. So especially in that third step, you don't want them to practice, practice, practice the wrong form because then they're practicing and they're getting that incorrect form. So someone said, you focus on input and output. However, I reckon interaction is vital for language acquisition. Do you have any plan to focus on peer interaction? So peer interaction could be in that fourth strand. Often peer interaction is practicing because everyone is using the language. So peer interaction is a vital part of that fourth strand. So I would incorporate that into my lesson. A good website for grammar check. Um, websites are usually terrible at grammar checking because they're their computers. Um, so no, I, I don't have any good ones. Um, are, are you suggesting to us that we should include an explicit grammar teaching phase as the part of communicative grammar instead of teaching grammar in an inductive way through communicative activities? According to the four strands, yes. If you want to spend some other time doing more inductive, you could do that, that's another approach. Um, you could also do more inductive in that first where you're just talking about language, they're getting a lot of that inductive. So when you're talking about Malala, you're using grammar. She was uh, shot when she was 14, something like that. So there is some inductive going on there. For low level students without a lot of vocabulary, it seems difficult to personalize. Is there a way for students to build vocabulary so that they can use them for communication? It's important to meet students where they are. So if they have low vocabulary, then your focus is on just a few basic vocabulary terms that they can access. So if you are familiar with the comprehensible input theory, I plus one, you don't want to spend time on vocabulary that's way above their level. So you start small and you focus on what's just outside of their reach so that they feel like they can achieve it. So for low level students, you're just, your goals are smaller, but the theory still applies. In order not to discourage students from expressing themselves, to what extent should we be correct their grammatical mistakes. So this is where you have nuance as an instructor and where you need to really know your students. So if your students are very skittish and any time that you correct them, they shut down, then you have to maybe early in the year, you do less and you build it and you change it more. So you really have to know your students and know what they can handle and what would be productive or what would harm them in terms of correcting them. But it is important that they learn the correct form. And this is a pro, you know, they're a work in progress. They're not going, we're not expecting perfection, right? But we are expecting that they learn the correct form and that we guide them through ways that they can learn that form and they can practice. So that, yes, it is, no, it isn't, 
that, you know, you're starting small and they're learning that and then they'll go, what's more appropriate for them. So you want to design your lesson so that it's not so hard that you're going to have to correct everything they say. That's when you have to think about your outcomes and make it so that students are going to be successful somewhat. I mean, they don't have to be perfect, but don't plan a lesson that's so hard they're gonna fail all the time. So that's where you have to think about your outcomes. It's a good question. Okay, so Padlet, um, could you tell me how to use Padlet in the real class? Students use the tablet or for homework. You could use them for either. So as long as they have some kind of device, you would somehow, depending on how your class is set up, send the Padlet out to your students and then they could do it in class. But I would encourage you to have them do it at home so you're not using that class time for them to do that. But you can do it in class as long as you have a device that students can work on. And I would encourage you to use cell phones in the classroom. Cell phones are free for you because students bought them already and most students have it. Maybe they don't all do. But this is an educational tool that is free for you because students all have them most of the time. So use it. But you also have to have strong classroom management to tell students to put it away, which is important as well. Okay, how do you teach grammar or writing to students with special needs? That's a huge question because it depends on their special need. It depends on the severity of that. And so that could be an entire presentation on itself. But again, what's important is that you know your students and you know what an achievable goal is for your student. That's as much as I can say without knowing more about the specific needs of the students. But um, the goal setting is very important there. I have 50 students in my classroom. How do you deal with the students who don't talk or talk only in Japanese? This is where I would use technology. And this is where their grades would be dependent on them doing some kind of production on some kind of tool when it would only be to you. If your students are not used to speaking, if you have a class full of students who aren't speaking, you're not gonna make them all speak and expect them to do it willingly immediately. So that's where I would use technology and have them do things where you're the only one listening. And then hopefully their ease would grow and then you could build on that. So I would use technology for sure for that. For 50 students, I would use technology a lot. I would use those tools like Flipgrid for them to practice using it because it's, it's, impractical to think that you are going to be able to do much interaction for 25% of your class with 50 students. So that's, I, I don't envy you, that's a huge challenge. Would it be possible to give students grammatical input through listening activities? Sure. Grammar is everywhere, which is why it's my favorite thing to teach. Grammar is everywhere. It's in everything that you hear, it's in everything that you say, it's in everything that you read. So that's the beauty of us as grammar teachers is we could use anything to teach grammar. So yeah, listening, what do you hear? What tense do you hear them using? So you could do that for the present perfect and the simple past, just make it a listening. If you wanna focus on the listening, what do you hear them in, what do you hear them using? So you're training the ears for that. It's all tied together. How can I make sure students focus on grammatical points when I get them? Yeah, so this is where I would, again, you have your target grammar. So you wouldn't just have them listen for all grammar. You would say, okay, our target grammar today is simple past. As you listen to this story, I want you to think about the ways that the simple past is being used. So that way they're focused on one thing to listen for. Okay, there's a question about putting PowerPoint slides at the American Center. I'm gonna leave that for Ochai-san or Grace. Would you share the good ways to evaluate students' personalized work? 
I would do that again through like a personal journal if you want a handwritten journal that only you and the students see. Or I would use some kind of educational technology like Flipgrid, OneNote, VoiceThread, Padlet. Even though that's not personal. Okay, so let's see, we have maybe one more question. Does the third strand mean to find students topic? No, you're responding to the topic you started with in the first strand. But you're finding you're asking students to engage in that topic you started with themselves. Okay. So it is 11 o'clock. Let me just see if there are any other questions that I have to answer. I will continue to answer a few more questions for maybe five more minutes. You are free to go. Our hour is up. Thank you for attending. I hope something was useful for you. I will stay for a few more minutes and I'll keep answering questions. If you want to stay, you're welcome to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we teachers have to use the textbook but sometimes it's hard to elicit their interest because the topic is not suited. Yeah, this is where textbooks can be really hard to use. It depends on if you have to use a textbook or not. If you have to use it for, um, as your administration tells you to. But that's where I would choose my own topics. Or if I could find a closely related topic that relates more to them. So maybe the topic is climate change and maybe they don't wanna read about nuclear power plants in wherever. So you say, okay, we're gonna talk about climate change in your house. How can you fight climate change in your house with your family? So a lot of times I would scrap the textbook altogether and do my own, but that's a lot of work. So I would try to adapt or to find a closely related topic that would, or an offshoot to supplement that would be more relevant to engage your students. What would be the appropriate ratio between speaking and writing in fluency development? So again, I think it, de it depends on your goals for your students. So if students are heavily preparing for the entrance exam, I would probably spend more time on writing. If they have part of the exam if they have to do some speaking I would spend time on that so it depends on the needs of your students and what you want them to do and that's where it's important as a staff as a school that you have your objectives clearly defined as a faculty what do our students need by the time they end our program and go off to college or go off to middle school or go to the next year what are our goals? Maybe they're more writing because it's higher level. Maybe they're young learners and it's mostly speaking. It depends. It depends on the needs and goals that you have. Is it good or bad for teachers to use Japanese to support students' comprehension? It's neither good nor bad. I would say that Japanese, using it in class is a great support, but I would try to use it less and less when possible. Because I think the tendency, and I've heard from teachers, you know, it's so much easier to explain things in Japanese because it's easier for me. I understand that completely. But I think you need to be moving toward more of a balance so that students somehow get more English. It's like the training wheels of a bicycle. We need those training wheels when we start to feel comfortable, to be confident, but we need to be pushing ourselves and our students to be able to communicate more in English because that's ultimately our goal. So it's not, it's not bad. That's why it's great to have an ALT and a JTE together. You can support students when they need that extra help, but you can also have some native speaking. I am teaching junior high school students. There are different level students. Yeah, so that is a challenge. And that's where I would have maybe in that fourth strand, I would differentiate, have a 
don't call it low, medium, and high for your students. Maybe have different colors and change the colors around so it's not like, oh, blues are always the low ones. But say, okay, today I want you guys to be in the blue group and you're gonna do this. And you guys are the red group, you're gonna do this. I would differentiate the way they practice, and the way they produce. It's not easy to differentiate in one classroom I don't envy you because that's not an easy thing to do, but I would differentiate in that output part. Is there any good site for practicing speaking by myself as a teacher? Um, not that I know of. You know, you've always got those language apps where you can speak into the app and they're they're so so I would I would try to make a friend with a native speaker I know that's that's not the easy way but that would be what I would do I don't know any good websites maybe someone else here does if you do please share but I don't know of any okay so that was rapid fire five minutes okay I'm gonna stop there because otherwise we'll keep going so um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for starting your Saturday with us. And I, I hope that this was helpful for you. Thank you very much.